Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Eric Fecky. Welcome back. Over the past few days, I've gotten a lot of questions by my patients regarding the testing that's been done for COVID-19. In the office, I use a whiteboard technique. It's simple but effective to explain complex issues. I hope that this helps you become an expert within the next 10 minutes on this topic. So, in order to begin, we need to understand the terms. SARS-CoV-2. That's the name of the virus, the germ. It's also called novel coronavirus 2019. This is the germ that causes the COVID-19 disease. We're going to come back and look at this drawing a little more closely so you understand the virus and what it does. We're going to explain the two different tests, how the virus acts and what our body does to it, how the tests work, and then how they're going to be used. So let's go to the tests. There are two types of tests. The first one is a mouthful. Reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, or RT-PCR, let's call it that. This is where we measure parts of the virus, our virus particles, in this case, the code. We get this from saliva in our mouth and our nose and use swabs to do this. This is what the long lines of cars and tests are for. The next one is called the serology or antibody titers. This is where we measure our body's own immune response, which are the antibodies or immunoglobulins. This is done using our blood. So let's go back and look at the virus a little more closely. This virus is really a capsule, a little sac that contains a code, in this case called RNA. This capsule has on it little particles or pieces, and they're different colors here in the diagram. Pay close attention to this one, the spiral one. These point out and give it an appearance of a crown, which gives this the name coronavirus, all these viruses because of the crown. We'll come back to this in a moment. So, in order to understand how the tests work, we need a quick crash course on DNA again, a refresher. DNA is made of nucleotides and then broken up into pieces called genes. Here we've drawn it as two strands, two green strands. Through an enzyme reaction, we get RNA as the next step. And this RNA uses more enzymes to eventually create the end product, our proteins. Look again, here is this crown, this spiral. But there are different ones as well. Remember that. So, if we look back at the DNA, you'll realize that in this virus, here is the RNA. There's that piece, that code. So how does the virus work? What does it do? Well, this has been figured out in the past several weeks. The virus needs to dump that code into your cells. In this case, cells in your lungs or respiratory tract, and specifically ones that have these little gates on them called ACE2. And what the virus does is uses this cone, this area to bore into the cell and kind of like a Trojan horse, dump this enemy, this, MRA, this RNA into the cell, uses the cell's own machinery, creates more copies of itself, takes over the cell, spreads, grows, and eventually kills the cell. What's really interesting is that these ACE2 receptors are more common, or they're more densely populated inside the lower parts of our breathing tract. Not as much so in our nose and mouth, and the deeper we go, there's more of them. Remember that, okay? So now, how does the virus do what it does and makes us sick? Well, many viruses basically make us sick because of our own body's response to them. Okay, so we need our own immune response. And what that is at the beginning is antibodies. These are upside down Y's in the drawing because they actually look like that in the microscope. So remember this one here, the spiral again, and here's blue antibodies that your body makes. And then there are other proteins and particles. We make other antibodies too. When we do this, what happens is the antibodies become like a beacon and they call other parts of our immune system and chemicals to fight this. They also may blunt the response of that little spiral and may, maybe it doesn't work so easily. And then if you look down here, here we've got all these antibodies calling in our immune system our inflammation. This may very well be how we get sick from this, but also may blunt the response of this spiral, which we think actually keeps our immune system down longer than typical SARS viruses, and that's perhaps why we're staying sick longer. So, how do the test? Let's go to the test now, now that we've got our background. The first test, the RT-PCR. Well, what we have to do is go in reverse from this DNA pattern that we talked about. We start with the virus's RNA, and all you need is a little piece of this. 
because what you're going to do is make lots of copies by using an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. We're going to go backwards and create one strand of the DNA and then use DNA polymerase to make two strands. And then we're going to churn this all up through many cycles using the polymerase chain reaction. That's the PCR part and make hundred to thousand fold more copies of this so we can actually measure this more easily. That's how we go from little to a lot. All right. The next test, number two, that's the serologies, where we measure our body's immune response, the antibodies. Now these tests have been done for a long time. In the early 1930s, these were used against strep, the one in your throat that caused things like rheumatic fever and scarlet fever. So this is not new. We've been doing this for a long time. And if you go back to our virus, in this case, look at the different pieces on it and that spiral again, there's the antibodies and we measure them. And there's two types. One that comes early, that's an early response called M, and then a later response called G. This is the one that lasts, we hope, and gives us some defense. And then what we do is we take the different antibodies and they become like the footprints in the snow. The germ is gone, but we know it's been there because it left some footprints. These are the antibodies. We put little markers on them. These markers stick to them, and in our test, they glow and we can see them. That's how we know they were there. Okay, so very important to review. On the RT-PCR, it's important to realize you have to have the virus in you at that time or it's useless. So it has to be in your mouth and nose, or that's where we get it, and it has to still be around. You need to have the infection for this to work. This test also takes a lot of resources. It takes time and people. They're trying to shorten it, but that's why it's taken so many days to get results for people. It's also very expensive. The serology or antibody test, remember again, the early one and the late measure how much are the titers. This gives us a sense of our own body's immunity. What we don't know is how long does it take for this to be made and how long will it last? These are important questions and which antibodies are important to give us a defense or a protection. And when we get a vaccine going, this will help us understand how we built a good boost of our immune system by measuring these antibodies to a, to a vaccine that will boost our system, give us antibodies that will last and protect us the next time. So now that we understand the two tests, the one that measures the virus particles using the DNA system and the other one it uses our antibodies, how are they going to be used? So I've made green the RT-PCR, the one in your nose, and blue for serologies. The first way we're going to use these tests is identify those who are carrying the virus and those who are sick with this specific virus. That's best by measuring the virus itself, of course, the particles of the virus. So the one in the swab, our RT-PCR is going to work best, not necessarily the one that measures the antibodies because you may not have made those yet. The next way we're going to use this is to calculate how many people have the infection and how many survive after they do. That's going to be best using the one that uses the antibodies because the infection may be gone by that point. So for example, if we go down into Brooklyn and take a thousand people and 800 of them are positive on the test, how many will get sick and how many will survive? If 200 are negative on the test, will any of them get sick? In this case, only five and how many will survive? This is the way we're going to use these tests. The other way to use it is to try to do some public health contact tracing or mitigation to try to control and the traffic flow and people contacting each other and spreading it around. That's going to again be easier if we know you have the virus in you. It, once it's gone and you measure antibodies, that's too late. And finally, here's the groundbreaker. This is the one that's going to be the big game changer. We need to identify who has the antibodies and an immune response and we need a test that lets us do that. That's going to be the serology test. That's going to let us know how good our response is to the virus. Do we develop a long acting response and do the vaccines work? So it's very important that you understand some of these basics. And I hope this helped because there's going to be a lot of dialogue in the next few weeks about this topic, whether they make sense, whether they work, whether they're good tests or not. I really want to advise you that you do not go to the internet. Do not go to eBay for this. Go for other things, but don't buy tests on this. This test has to be done well-planned, well-controlled, and it has to be done in a way that your doctors and the scientists recommend. We want one test or a few tests that are good, not a bunch of tests that don't work or that are fake and you're paying a lot of money for it. So please understand when you're looking at these things, I hope this helps you do that. If you have any questions or would like to talk more about this, I can be reached and I, I would love your comments on Dr. Fetke MD on Facebook and Instagram. That's D-R-F-E-T-H-K-E-M-D. I hope this was helpful. I hope you're staying safe and I will stay in touch until tomorrow.